So welcome back to my lectures. Uh, there's a lot to cover this week. You'll be reading six chapters from Richard Alley's Earth, the Operator's Manual. I hope that you've gotten used to his style a little bit and can move through this material a little more quickly. It's very helpful to have those questions and comments on perusal, so please do continue to do that. That's a great way for us to communicate. So for today, I want to talk about history and climate, uh, looking particularly again at this issue of geologic time, the ice core data, and now introducing the Milankovitch cycles, which are the cycles by which we uh, understand how the sun is working as part of the climate system. Our objectives for last week, which were to explain the carbon cycle and the greenhouse effect. I hope that you all did well uh, on the quiz, but please do pay attention to this and uh, spend some time reviewing if necessary. And that you also understand peer review and those basic feedback mechanisms. This week, we're going to look more at the history of Earth's climate uh, in more detail than we've done until this point to understand ice cores and evidence such as sediment cores and understand how these are used to reconstruct that history. And of course, we have the benefit of having Richard Alley as our special guest on Wednesday. So the science that we're looking at all together in this first unit, we've already covered framing the climate issue and the history of energy usage in Pennsylvania. We've covered the carbon cycle now you see we're at the history of Earth's climate. We'll be talking a little bit later this week about measuring the current warming, and then next week, the role of oceans. So all together then, this sets up our unit of the science of climate change. Now, we talked before about timescales. This is in fact an old slide, but I wanna go back to this because it's so important that we keep track of the different concepts of time here. The weather versus climate, right? And Richard Alley is going to be talking about this this week. The inability to predict exactly how much snow we're going to have, for example, or what the snowfall will be like in the coming storm in a week from now or two weeks from now, compared to our confidence in looking long-term and seeing the long-term effects of these big climate drivers. For our human concept, right, this idea of a human being, a 70 or 80 year lifetime, and then looking back at the history of uh, carbon dioxide emissions, and you see that almost all of these carbon dioxide emissions have been in the last 70 years. First human civilizations going back 7,000 years. So our understanding, our, our history, the, the things that we can know and we pass down from one generation to another about climate and weather are all based in this very small slice of the history of Earth's climate. The ice core records, tremendously important this week, uh, go back to that 400,000 year and 800,000 years for some cores perhaps even older in some other cases. Uh, there is a video this week with Sridhar Anandakrishnan. Many of you attended his special lecture last week, but he takes us to the Penn State ice cores. We actually have 40,000 year old ice uh, here at Penn State. And then geologic time, right? So keep in mind all these different scales. We're talking about the earth at 4.5 billion years, right? For the first 4 billion years, there was virtually no life or very little small amounts of life until about 500 million years. So half a billion years ago, we had this explosion of plant and animal life that changed Earth's atmosphere tremendously, putting oxygen enough in that atmosphere such that land animals could survive, which did not exist on the planet. We know that from the fossil record. Interestingly, limestone, again, remember limestone from the iron furnaces, limestone has locked up the majority of ancient carbon dioxide in this process of shell building by these undersea creatures that have then locked that carbon in calcium carbonate in their shells 
uh, over hundreds of millions of years. So this is the big time scale. Again, only a small part of Earth's history altogether, but looking back 600 million years ago, and you can see here this uh, range of carbon dioxide to the extent that we can know uh, from between four and a half to uh, 7,000 parts per million in the Cambrian period. And then this rapid decline over uh, several millions of years, right? But this, this rapid decline that's happening in carbon dioxide levels as those uh, creatures are sequestering the carbon dioxide in their shells um, and gradually then this uh, going down over time uh, until we get then to the, the modern period, which is way over here, right? So remember, this is 100 million years. We're going to be looking at the ice core record, which is just a million years, right? Just a little tiny, tiny one hundredth of that distance there. Okay, so let's think a little bit about um, the, the geologic scale in terms of carbon sequestering. So this is that rock weathering thermostat that Richard Alley will be talking about in more detail this week. He mentioned it already in his lecture last week. This rock weathering thermostat works, but it takes a long time. So this is the primary way that carbon dioxide gets out of the atmosphere over the long term. And how do we know this? We can look back most recently at the PETM, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And we see there that carbon dioxide was much higher in the atmosphere. Again, as Ali says, we don't really know exactly why, but perhaps it was volcanoes or a series of other events that put a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then we can see that carbon dioxide moving out of the atmosphere in this warmer world, faster with a warmer world in this process of rock weathering. So rock weathering, we can uh, sketch out here in a chemical formula. So we have the CO2, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which combines with water, with rain, and, and forms then an acid, carbonic acid, which then itself washes over the top of rocks. Uh, here, rocks made of calcium carbonate, CaCO3, and those form then calcium bicarbonate, uh, which then washes into the oceans and is the hardness in water that is used for shell formation. So in this process, we have the, um, the interaction of carbon dioxide with rocks through the water that then washes away and, and sequesters that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It takes a very long time to do. Now, so this is an example here of some limestone and you can see that it's quite weathered in this process of wearing down. The overall history, and again, here's a graph, pay attention here because the present day is over here on the left now in this graph and then you're looking back in time, moving to the right here in terms of tens of millions of years. So um, altogether, then this is less than 100 million years. So to, to put it in scale with that other graph that I just showed you. And one of the reasons I want to show this to you is because, first of all, um, this refers to alkanones. So Richard Alley talks about these in sediments and uh, the way that alkanones can serve as a proxy for understanding what past temperatures were. And um, you see them here uh, being used to understand uh, past levels of carbon dioxide. And there are two, two ranges which refer to the uncertainty. Uh, so we, we get different information. We can see an overall trend but there is some significant uncertainty between these proxies and our understanding of the, of the past in this way. Uh, you see then this period about 55 million years ago between the Paleocene and the Eocene period, this PETM, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, um, where we have this estimate of temperature range and this estimate of high levels of carbon dioxide and then that carbon dioxide going down 
over time, uh, just as the temperatures went down over time. Uh, but again, note the range here in terms of trying to reconstruct that past temperature. That's why this is a kind of fuzzy scale here, because uh, we have uncertainties that are built into the system. I want to point out, we're talking about tens of millions of years ago, and the uh, earliest fossil record of humanoids, so this is not modern humans, this is the um, famous Lucy skeleton uh, of three and uh, three million or three and a half million years ago. Um, the the um, Australopithecus afarensis, which uh, was the missing link in some ways between chimpanzees over here and the modern human. And again, this is 3.6 million years ago. And if you look at that in terms of the scale here, that is way down at this point, right? So not even human civilization, but the, the, the uh, precursor to modern human beings are only a very small, tiny part of this history. So the ice core data, again, only going back, in this case, 800,000 years. So a small slice even of that tens of millions of years that we were looking at before. And the ice core data is excellent for giving us uh, past CO2 levels. So remember, with ice cores, we are actually sampling little bubbles of air that were caught inside uh, these glaciers. And so in a way, give us a direct measurement of what ancient air was like. Now, one of the things you'll see in the Richard, the short Richard Alley video that, that comes with this is the, the care that's taken to carefully record data and to avoid things that could contaminate that data. There is a lot of careful work done in the science of giving us these numbers um, and continued skepticism, questioning of, of the nature of the data and our ability to reconstruct the past using this data. So do pay attention at all times to the way that scientists are actually working on this material. So when we talk about models then, how do we take these data and put them into a story about the past? Now, Milankovitch is a great example. So here's a, um, an astronomer, a mathematician, who is reconstructing the history of Earth's relationship to the sun and came up with a theory that this would help explain the glaciation of the Earth over time. Pretty much right, but according to his understanding, when the sun is, is when the Earth is tilted uh, toward the sun and the north is away from the sun, then the south should heat up. But what we see is that when the north of the hemisphere gets cool because it's tilted away from the sun, then uh, the south also gets cool. And the only way to explain this is through carbon dioxide. Likewise, when the north warms up, it is more toward the sun and the south is, is more away, uh, then the whole earth heats up. So, the, the role of carbon dioxide here, uh, as, as we look at this history, is the missing piece for to help us understand what is going on in terms of Earth system. So we have this production of models. Milankovitch gave it a shot. He had to be corrected by other, sco other scholars, other scientists with better data. And then we add to that data from ice cores and data from sediments that confirm some things and uh, force us to revise some of the things. So this is that scientific process of constantly improving on these models. In all of this, if you don't have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you can't explain what happens in the record. So when we think then, and this now is looking ahead to the readings for Friday, 
of all the different, as Richard Alley talks about, the different soccer players, uh, the, the different players on the, on the ground that are forcing that ball to move in a certain direction. And of course, we've got carbon dioxide. We have volcanoes, ozone, land use, sun, clouds, you have all these different things that could play a role. And we test these by comparing them with past history. Uh, so this is a, a great, and this is just a different depiction of what you see in the book, in the Richard Alley book. Um, but we have here, for example, temperature readings. So we have direct temperature readings going back to about um, the middle of the 19th century. And those are depicted here in, in red. Okay, so that red is the same in each of these three graphs. That was first temperature in the past. This is not the hockey stick graph. This is not using proxies. This is pretty much direct measurement. Uh, it's not perfect because back in 1850, they measured things a little bit different, which Ali talks about this. But by and large, this is uh, giving us a pretty good idea of what temperatures were like in the past. Now, if we just have um, in our model what we know about natural forcings, by, by which I mean volcanoes and the atmosphere and what happened with the sun and, and all these sorts of things, you see that the model can't explain what's going on with, uh, it, it can't explain what we observe the temperature to be. And, and likewise, if we just have uh, the history of human changes to the world, and this is land use changes as well as the burning of carbon of, of fossil fuels and putting carbon dioxide directly into the atmosphere, um, we also don't quite follow what history is. It's only when we put all of that together into a model that has both the natural forcings as well as human involvement that then our model matches the observation. So again, it's important to note here that it's not that the model is being tuned to the observations. It's that we have the observations and then we try to think of all the things that could affect uh, the history of Earth's temperature and put them into a huge computer program and we crunch the numbers. And then we see that unless we also include the human involvement, that we can't account for what's happened to Earth's temperatures. In all this, again, there is uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty because of the data we're collecting, uncertainty because of the use of proxies. Uh, there is variability over time. We can collect data from one place, but does that mean that we're getting a good, accurate sense of the Earth as a whole? And then there's this fundamental issue of climate sensitivity. The data change. We, we have this problem of um, what, what we're seeing in the data, whether it's accurately telling us what's going on or whether it is noise, so to speak. And here, uh, this is a very important uh, graph that you're going to see in the reading for Friday. I want you to pay a lot of attention to this because this is all those different players, right? So we've got clouds, we've got um, uh, different ice albedo, right, so that's snow, and then uh, land use changes, water vapor in the atmosphere, ozone has an effect, and then uh, greenhouse gases uh, produced by human beings. And some of these, right, have a cooling effect. Uh, not, not everything that's going on in the world has a warming effect, right? Some of this has a cooling effect, and then some has a warming effect, and you put all of those together, if you were just talking about the natural influences, you see that there's a slight um, tendency toward warming that, that's happening there. Um, but if you add then the human activities to that, you see uh, we can account for the warming that we are in fact seeing in the world. But there is this tremendous range of uncertainty and, and that's really important. And the uncertainties multiply themselves, right? There are things that we still don't know about the system. And that's the issue of climate sensitivity. Precisely how sensitive is the climate to these changes that we are forcing in the world? And how quickly 
will the climate respond to these changes? So we can look at the ancient past, at the Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum, and see some changes over time. As Richard Alley says, there are some very problematic issues in that past. So we see an utter uh, destruction of life on the ocean floor, for example. We don't know exactly what all is going to happen in our climate future, but we try to look back at the past and make the best judgments that we can. What we do know is that we are changing things much faster than have been changed uh, in, the, in the past, so far as we can go back 60 million years and reconstruct that past. So, as we've said many times, there is science and the way that scientists understand and talk about the, the past, and then there is people's use of, of science, and sometimes not being accurate and not even being fair. Uh, so we need to pay attention to this and do our best to understand what the correct uh, scientific view is and to learn where we can get trustworthy information. So when we look here um, at graphs and numbers, and you'll see these all over the web, um, Ali points out, for example, this kind of thing, the argument that um, the earth actually cooled. And so I pulled this one out, which was arguing that between 2000 and 2012, that the earth actually cooled. And, you know, you go down here to the overall uh, graph, this between um, 1880 and uh, 2019 is the last measurement here. And what you see is that if you do select here 1998, as your beginning date and your end date, you select here 2010, that that line does in fact go down. You know, that is, that is true. That if that's what you're looking at, you can, this is called cherry picking, right? You just pick this one cherry out of the data and you say, look, the earth is cooling. It's not really warming. But of course, over the long period, that uh, trend is going up. Um, and it just so happens that 1998 was an anomalous year. Look how much warmer 1998 was than any other year in that recent past. Um, and so you take that anomalously warm year and compare it and you have that. And then here's another set of graphs that I ran across uh, on the interwebs. And, and I loved this one because it was just, it's such an obvious misuse of, of information. So here's the argument that uh, actually when we look at um, Arctic Ocean and we look at Arctic Ocean ice, we see, uh, according to this graph, that the fifth year ice, the oldest ice, was actually increasing from 2012 to 2015. And, and that uh, overall, you find second year ice and third year ice uh, increasing during this period. And so the point here is to say those people who are saying that the ice is disappearing on the Arctic are totally wrong. And if you look at the data, the oldest ice is actually increasing during this time. So what are they talking about? How can this happen if the world is warming? Well, it happens like this. If you look at this graph, what you see is that they're not talking about total ice. They're talking about percentage of ice. And when you look at the total amount of ice over the long term, you see that the total amount of ice is going dramatically down. And the total amount of fifth year ice, so the oldest ice uh, on the Arctic Ocean, is really falling. Now, if we go down again, cherry pick our data here um, between 2012 and 2015, then you do see a slight rise. But the overall trend is clearly down and certainly much lower than anything it had been uh, back in the 90s. So be very careful of this and be skeptical of this information. Part of their point is to create confusion. All they want to do is to put a question in your mind as to are these scientists really telling the truth? And maybe they have an ulterior motive. If they can make the question happen, then a lot of people will just ignore it because they don't want to be involved in politics, right? 
The answer to this is always to go to peer-reviewed sources, and especially the international assessments. So as Ali points out, this is taking that peer-reviewed science and reviewing it again, aggregating it, giving an overall assessment of where we are. These assessments happen only once every five years, uh, but they give us this over this, this big bird's eye perspective of what's happening. The National Academy of Sciences, of course, is another excellent source. Uh, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the International Group, and the National Academy of Sciences, again, these are unpaid voluntary positions that scientists are honored to be a part of. Penn State has contributed uh, more science scientists uh, to these reports than almost anywhere else. Uh, and has a number of people who have served as lead authors of significant sections. But continue to be skeptical, ask questions, try to understand the basic science that's going on. The medieval warm period then is a final example that some people use to say, look, the science is not, not accurate, there's been warming in the past, and look how warm things were a couple hundred years ago. Well, of course, the problem here is that what they're talking about is information from just one small part of the globe. The medieval warm period tends to refer to what's happening in the northern hemisphere, specifically in northern Europe, uh, when it was anomalously warm. But we have almost no information from that period for what was going on in the southern hemisphere. And the information we do have shows that, in fact, these things balanced out. But Ali has another warning for us. He says, if, if scientists are wrong and the medieval warming period actually showed that the whole of the globe was warm, that's a warning to us because it suggests that climate sensitivity is much greater than we thought. And let me just restate this. So in other words, we know what changes happened uh, in the medieval period. We can look at atmospheric CO2 and we can look at uh, what happened in terms of our proxies and what's going on with the sun and radiation and such. So looking at that, if scientists are wrong, and in fact the whole earth was warm and not just uh, parts of the Northern hemisphere, then that suggests to us that the whole earth is much more sensitive to these small changes in, in, car in forcings, in climate forcings. So therefore, the amount of carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere may have, in fact, a much greater effect on the Earth's climate than we're assuming. So looking ahead then this week, again, Monday, uh, for some of you today, if you're uh, watching this on Monday, we are having our research pod discussion as usual and preparing the uh, presenters who are going to be taking part in the webinar, our second webinar with Richard Alley on Wednesday. Friday, there is another quiz. Uh, this one's going to be entirely on Canvas uh, for you to take in class. And again, we will go over it in class. Please focus on my lectures where I'm just summarizing the most important details for you and uh, compare that with the readings where you're going to get much more uh, detailed background. And these multiple choice questions will cover both my lectures and those readings. Looking ahead to next week, on Monday, we're going to have a workshop on, on actually sketching out some of these climate interactions we're talking about. That's, you'll find that on the first unit exam. I'm actually going to ask you to draw out some of these interactions, such as the carbon cycle, or um, the, the water vapor cycle. And uh, then Friday, so now a week from Friday, February 19th, is our final special guest visit from Dr. Ray Najar, the oceanographer. And we're adding here to the Richard Alley book because he doesn't really do enough, in my view, in talking about the role of the oceans. So we have a chance to add some information that I think is quite important. Thanks very much, and we'll look forward to seeing you in class. Uh, please, as always, do let me know if you have any comments or questions, and asking them right here in perusal is a terrific way to do that. I'm so enjoying our interaction. See you soon.